personal, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the ways and needs to promote rapid data sharing. This is how several of us, and maybe some of you, hopefully all of you, uh, consider scientific communication via publication these days. And that is that scholarly articles have effectively become advertisements of scholarship rather than the actual scholarship itself. That because they're not including the artifacts, such as the data, the computational tools, the methods, etc., The core scientific statements and assertions actually rely upon this information, but they're hidden behind the conventional scholarly narratives. And it's this lack of transparency and the lack of credit for anything other than regular dead tree type publications that is creating several issues within the scientific community. Now, I like to start my talks with a tale of two bacteria. On May 2nd in 2011, the German doctors reported the first case of an E. coli infection that was accompanied by hemolytic uremic syndrome. On May 21st, the first, first death from this occurred, and there was a sudden outcry in a variety of areas that impacted economics in terms of where this bacteria came from, in terms of whether this was spreading to other uh, countries, which it was, and so on. So on June 3rd, BGI, uh, which is a, the largest genomics institute in the world, received a sample from doctors at the University of the Medical Center, uh, uh, Hamburg Eppendorf. And they uh, sequenced the draft of the E. coli within hours of receiving the sample. And this was done on an ion torrent. Now, they had the draft sequence, and they sat down to say, what shall we do? What will happen if we release the data sequence immediately? What are the potential repercussions? And one of the questions that arose was that if the data was released, would it affect their ability to publish later? Now, people were dying. But this was a, re a reality. It's an important question, actually, because a scientist's funding and recognition comes from publishing. Currently, that is the money by which a scientist is able to continue to produce. But in balance of this is the fact that people were dying. So in one world, you have the researchers who are rightly concerned about their ability to publish and their ability to get recognition and grants who wait. And then the first publication appears about two months later. In another world, the researchers decided that public health was more important than obtaining a publication, and they released the, the data early. In this case, the first publication appeared on July 29th but it was not from the group who released the data, although information from their data release was included. Now, that is the world in which we lived, and that data was released. The question about whether they were able to publish if the data was released, whether it was real or imagined, actually had an impact on one of the researchers deciding not to release some of his data prior to publication. And this uh, researcher said that the competition is why his group did not release the 2001 strain sequence. Now, this strain was not the outbreak strain, but it was one that in the studies, based on the uh, available data, people had discovered was likely to be an earlier version of this bacteria, of the outbreak bacteria, and people wanted to compare it. But I have to tell you, I'm not convinced that his decision not to do this, given the state of things, was morally wrong. But this was what happened. What happened, though, on the other side, where the data were released, they were put immediately into an F FTP server. They were given a data DOI, which I'll talk about later, and, but the DOI has the effect of making the data, no matter where that information is used, able to be followed and permanent. 
The data were also put out under a CC0 waiver, which meant anybody could use these data. And at, this turned into the first E. coli crowdsourcing, and people are calling it a tweeno, because as soon as this information was tweeted uh, by our team, there was an immediate discussion on Twitter about what had happened, what we could do. People began creating assemblies, using different programs, comparing things. BGI continued to update this sequence as more came out. They created a GitHub site for everybody to cross work on. So this was very much real-time science. There was no publication, but action was happening rather than waiting for a publication to occur. There were exciting downstream uh, if the consequences for this. First of all, it created an example of how to do faster and more open science. And this project effectively stood as a way to ease the future of rapid genome research, uh, genome release, and uh, data release and research. And it even had an impact on the Royal Society's recommendation for how data should be released. And they presented the E. coli um, on the cover of their report that year in 2012 when they, they set out uh, information on their expectations for data release. So all of that aside, I think we can all agree that releasing the E. coli data ahead of publication was good. When they did these analyses, they found where the uh, um, antibiotic resistance area was, they found out why it was causing kidney failure, which was due to the, trans, uh, the transfer of uh, Shigella gene. They found out, they created ways to track the um, sequence to be able to do immediate diagnostics. And they also found that, that E. coli did not come from Spain, but instead was from homegrown in, in Germany had actually caused a lot, millions and millions of dollars in damage. So from the perspective of public health, I think we can all agree that this is a good reason to release data rapidly. And these are the numbers. For the E. coli outbreak in 2011, 4,000 people were infected and 53 died. How many more would have happened in the time, it's very difficult to say. It's very difficult at this point to really say whether or not having that data out ahead of time did or didn't make a difference. But if we are going to agree that having data out is essential as rapidly as possible because this can save lives, then we should really look at the numbers from a World Health perspective. In infectious diseases, these are the numbers of people that die per year. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the fact that 53 people died from this infection. I'm not trying to diminish the fact that 5,000 people were ill from this. But if we're talking about the need for releasing data is important for health, then every single study that has data available for any of these diseases should be released prior to publication if possible, but as rapidly as possible. Now, this is World Health, big reason, but there's a lot of reasons why sharing data is essential. First of all, it aids fields. This is a, a, a graph showing how uh, the release of a particular genome sequence pushed the availability, the, act, the uh, research and publications on rice versus wheat. So you can see that at the point prior to when the rice genome was released, the publications between wheat and rice were relatively the same. Both were climbing. But upon release of the rice genome sequence, the rice publications went up markedly. And a report by Puaro, sorry, Puaro, 
my pronunciation is terrible, shows that every 10 data sets collected contributes to at least four papers in the following three years. So data has, data in and of itself has a huge impact on the movement of research in a community. And while there's a lot of focus, and rightly so, on concepts and findings being the important element, in fact, none of those can happen without the data. And the longer it takes to have access to the data, the longer it takes for concepts and conclusions and advances to make. Authors are very reticent, actually, to share their data. But the facts are that sharing data is associated with an increased citation rate of their papers, regardless of whether it's cited. So if you cite data in your paper, you get higher citations. And then we've all heard ad nauseum the fact that there are a lot of problems with reproducibility in, in publications. And what I want to highlight from this graph is that for the large chunk of papers from uh, or microarray papers that could not be re reproduced, the major reason why is that the data were not available. The other reasons were software not available, the methods were unclear, and there was no specific reason, but the results were just different. And I think we have to expect that. Sharing can also reduce retractions. And the way this can happen is some of these retractions occur because people have not, do not have uh, access and information on the data prior to publication. Reviewers do need to see data. If there's a problem with a paper, it's important that the data be completely available so people can quickly assess and address it. Um, I like uh, hy hyperbolic statements, so according to the current graph, uh, in 2045, as many papers will be published as retracted. Now, the issue with data sharing is, of course, the hurdles. If only it were easy. There are so many reasons why researchers do not share data. And the majority of these are actually good reasons. Uh, Wiley has recently done a study to get information on how, how many researchers uh, share data and their insights on the reasons why they don't. So their objective was to establish a baseline view of data sharing, practices, attitudes, and motivations globally. So they contacted over 90,000 researchers. And from these, they received an overwhelming 2,886 responses, which is big, but relative to however many they asked, it seems kind of small. But still, it's uh, suitable for making some conclusions. They found that most researchers say they are sharing their data, and that those who are not sharing have a variety of different reasons. Also, the data that is being shared is typically less than 10 gigabytes. And the most common type of data that is being shared is in a flat file, so it's not necessarily easily machine readable. And also, their data is usually saved on hard drives at their university, sometimes even on thumb drives. And so if they're not making it available, it is easily, easily lost. So the findings they had on why the researchers didn't share the data was inter intellectual property or confidentiality issues. And this is a big problem because universities have been told they have to find ways to monetize the research that they're doing. But there's also a misunderstanding of what intellectual property really is with regard to researchers. So when they're told no, they, it's sort of a broad no. So more education is required on this area. This, however, is important, that they are concerned that their research might be scooped, and it will be. How can we protect researchers who are sharing data from being scooped? What things can we put in place to protect them? Part of it has to be an agreement among the community to behave in a gentlemanly -like manner with people who are sharing data. They also have concerns about misinterpretation or misuse. They have concerns about attribution and citation credit. 
because currently there really is none. They have ethical concerns. This is a big one, insufficient time and resources to do it, and that funder in, uh, funders and institutions don't require sharing, so they just don't. They don't have the funding to do it. They don't know where to share, and they're not sure how to share. So the question is, how can publishers promote data sharing, and, and why us? First of all, researchers are never so captive as when they are publishing. They will do anything just to get that paper out, almost anything. We need to help them. Harassing them alone and saying, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, is not enough. And we actually have a huge number of resources at our hands to be able to do this. And we, look at the, we should look at this as carrots and sticks. First of all, you have to create journal data release policies. And every one of you has different communities that are more or less amenable to releasing data. I often get in Twitter arguments about how people can't do these things. And, and it's not that I don't understand. It's just that we really need to think about, is it important? And if it is, and I hope you agree it is, if it is, how can you start to move people in this direction? How can you help them? The other thing is, is a lot of journals have data release policies, but a lot of them don't check that the policy was actually followed. Um, it's not easy to do that. Jur uh, a lot of times authors say, we're putting this data into uh, the uh, NCBI's database, but it takes time for this to occur. It does. But you can get an accession number prior to the completion of your, of your update. So you can ask for specific things ahead of time to do this. But you also need to follow up. You, really important, though, is finding ways to aid researchers in releasing data. And there are a lot of ways to do this. Different journals, however, have different uh, access to these, these um, ways of doing so. But collaboration in this area can be really effective. So you have to consider ways to support and protect the researchers who do share data. And what I'm going to talk about next, specifically, is promoting data citation, because this overcomes at least one of the issues, which is the incentives and credit that researchers need. If they're only getting incentives from the concept publications where they use the data, two things happen. They cannot risk losing the ability to publish that paper. If they can't risk it, then they can't release the data, because either they will be scooped, or a journal will tell them this information is already out, and therefore is not of interest to our readership. So, there's been a lot of discussion, not, not only since 2009, about how to get people to release data. And one of these has been to provide credit for researchers who release data so that you can search the literature and be able to appropriately uh, provide the credit to the person who provided the data that was done by this, uh, what, that was used in this experiment. The Toronto International Data Release Workshop also said data producers benefit from creating a citable reference as it can be later used to reflect the impact of data sets. If you can reflect how your data was used, if you can track it, then you can show to funding agencies that what you have done is of value to the research community in much the same way that paper citations now are used to show the value that you are contributing to the, to the, to the university. When I was at, uh, I was a, a, a executive editor of Genome Research, and it was astonishing how difficult it was to get a way to cite data. I talked about putting data links to the, the databases in journals, which a lot of journals now do, that you have a, a URL that links you to the data. The problem is, is those can go away. I talked to several of the tracking organizations about finding a way to track the use of the URLs. But again, because of the non-permanent way 
that, uh, of, of citing these, there wasn't a good way to track them. It was actually very frustrating. Now, the genomics data sharing policies have really pushed the genomics community. And several meetings have provided information on how and when to release data. Most of it is immediate. In the data sharing um, report from the Fort Lauderdale meeting, they said that, a, that one should appropriately cite the source of the data analyzed and, act, and acknowledge the resource producers. There's no way to do that then. There were myriad publications about how, how we can cite these people. And although the bulk of the human genome community really followed these initiatives because the funding agencies were paying attention. The other genome data is on and off following that. So creating a way to cite the data using DOIs is not new. The physical sciences have actually been doing this for a while, and they've been using data cite among several other citation indices. Uh, Organizations. And I'm going to talk about data site because this is the data uh, DOI group that we use for citing our data. But I want to highlight here before I move forward that not only are there ways that, as Carol said, there are numerous ways uh, to uh, give data DOIs, but also there are a lot of other ways beyond DOIs to cite data. There are URIs that people can use. The, the physical sciences have been doing more than just data citation uh, with DOIs. Anyway, uh, data cite uh, had a specific focus on providing uh, citation for data sets rather than for uh, scholarly articles. Now, we envision research publication at Giga Science as a way of communicating science as a whole. We do standard publication, and this is a paper in Giga Science, but we have linked to that our own database. Um, and we, all the data that are associated with that paper are published and linked to our database in, in a data publishing platform. And these are given a DOI by data site. So the data itself can be published. I'm not going to talk about this today, but we also include with this a data analysis platform because having data available alone is not enough. Now, other journals are now doing similar things to this. Um, and this is most commonly being done in the form of data paper rather than the release of data in it, uh, that is citable in and of itself. So a data paper is effectively a description of the data. But this is actually really important because currently most descriptions are ending up in the supplemental material. So some of the other journals, and it's more than this, I just, to fill a slide, uh, to not go over a, a, a slide, I highlighted um, the two others. Faculty of a Thousand Research, which was launched in 2012, they have data papers and they also have, like us, uh, several other types of papers. And then launched this year with scientific data and that solely publishes data descriptors. So these actually, these data papers are in the standard paper format. So these are ways to cite data as a paper. Now, as I said, we have a linked database, and within that, our data are given a DOI. So the data itself can be cited separately. Now, some people think of this as salami slicing, but in fact, salami slicing was established when data sets were very small and really could only be used for one thing. And this was in the early 2000s when salami slicing, in terms of using your data in multiple ways, was set in place. And times have changed. Data sets now are useful not just for the one thing that they were originally collected for. Um, now, as I said, we, can, we have this database because we're in a collaboration, and I want to highlight collaboration because I think this is something that everybody can do. We're in a collaboration with Biomed Central, and they handle the standard editorial publishing side of, of, the, of the journal. 
and then BGI, which has an enormous data storage capacity. So we, from a financial standpoint, which is a big issue, we're piggybacking in on their huge data storage facility for themselves, and we have our own private server and servers, actually, at this point, to host the data. So the costs for us to host data is incredibly low, and at this point, uh, really not even something that we have to fund. So that was a way to not have to put up a whole bunch of upfront money. Um, but as I was saying, journals, and in fact the Faculty of a Thousand and uh, scientific data are making uh, use of the community databases as well. And so any journal can really do this. They can take advantage of all these available resources, which include, for example, the usual suspects that handle omics data. But there's also databases that I'm sure everybody's familiar with that also provide data DOIs, like Dryad and Figshare. Now, each of your journals probably has a specific community, some of them broader than others, but your your researchers then are storing data that they're using somewhere. And there are often, if there's enough, a community repository. And I encourage everybody to make use, to make collaborations with these repositories. They would love to have your data put into the repository. Now, how permanent this is, is another question. The permanency can be relative, but certainly a community-built database is more permanent than a disk drive in one laboratory. Now, for data citation to work, we need acceptance by journals, the data and citation to be included in the references where they're more easily tracked, we need tracking by citation indices, and this use, there needs to be some metrics within the community, part of which can be applied by uh, tracking with citation indices, but also an understanding among the community of how this is used. Without all three of these, the usefulness of data being made available in a citable format really doesn't help. So I'm going to talk first about acceptance by journals. This is simply accepting the fact that it is okay to publish data prior to publishing the analysis paper. And Faculty of a Thousand, in principle, uh, faculty of a thousand checked with a whole series of journals to find out which ones would consider pre-publication of data to be a prior publication that might preclude the publication of the analysis paper. And I actually found that the vast majority of journals either a, a, in principle agreed or actively were in the process of allowing data citation. The two respondents who said that they might consider it a, there was a potential that it would be considered a, a prior publication was Cell Press and the Annals of Oncology. So is this being adopted by the community? Let's go back to E. coli. As noted, the articles, um, uh, uh, there were articles of, uh, made available on this early released and citable data. So journals were okay with that data being released. But the early releasers were not the first to publish. And the data was not cited in any of these papers. So the, the article that was published um, by the, the, uh, the, the individuals who released the data and the individuals who did all the crowdsourcing was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the New England Journal of Medicine is widely known as a journal that says you can't talk about your research prior to publication, or we won't consider it, that the information is out there. It's called the Engelfinger Rule. Um, but they were fine with this. Um, and this was published on August 25th. And here is where they discussed that the, uh, how the information was crowdsourced, that, they, uh, that the data was put through high throughput sequencing, and there was a public data release, release et cetera. Um, but the journal said, no, we're not going to include the data citation uh, because it wasn't relevant to this paper. Nor was there any indication anywhere in the paper of where this genome information could be found. 
The other paper that came out, and this was the first one to come out, uh, was um, a uh, was uh, from a a group um, that published in the archives of microbiology. And this is the first article to come out. And this one actually used the genome sequence that was used in the crowdsourcing, as well as another genome sequence that was also released as soon as they produced the data, though not as widely announced, and another uh, data, data set that was available. Um, so it was first, but there's nowhere in the paper is there any indication of where they obtained this data. They say they used it, but you can't, there's nothing in the paper to say where. So first of all, you can't compare, uh, check to see if these findings, that it was 99.8, 99.5, or 99.9 um, uh, identity uh, between what they were looking at and what the data were uh, that they used. Ultimately, if you do a search like I did, backwards and forwards, to look up the uh, LB226692 data, or also the fact that I knew these were in the SRA, you could find them. Um, the other odd thing is there is no indication of where to obtain the data they generated in this paper. So altogether, while the data, I'm not saying anything was incorrect in this paper, there's no way to check whether or not their findings were based on data. So the other paper that was published soon after that, at the end of July, um, was by um, a group that not only had released the, the, uh, the outbreak data ahead of time, but they also had a strain from 2001 this is a group that had the strain from 2001 that people felt might be the, the, uh, related to the current outbreak. Um, and, but his paper included a comparison of that, and those data were not released until this paper came out. So this was the situation where data that might be relevant to public, uh, public health during a potential pandemic was not available uh, at the time. The other thing, again, is there's no link to the accession number in this paper for any of that data. And I'm going to point out for all of these papers that I'm saying there's no easily available, because I scanned through it, and then I read through it, and I looked for accession. I couldn't find it. Now, someone may be able to go through it in more detail and find it, but data should be easily found. OK. Now. That report did include a reference for the, for the data that was released uh, by BGI group, even though they didn't use it in their analysis. So they simply mentioned, which was nice, uh, uh, but not necessary, actually, since they didn't use it, but they mentioned that there was another independent uh, analysis, uh, sequence uh, using the same uh, DNA sequencer. And this is how they cited it, using the uh, FTP site. If you click on that link today, this is what you get. Nothing. Which is too bad because even though the FTP site included the data citation, another, uh, uh, and it was on the CLIMB uh, climb, uh, climb database that BGI has, when we migrated it to this site, if you use the DOI, it links to this. So if you have a DOI, even though we migrate the citation, it is, it is included. included. It, it directs you to where the data can now be found. Whereas using an FTP site, there's no permanence with that. So, so acceptance of journals saying we will publish a paper even if there's prior data looks to be OK. Not every journal still indicated they weren't interested. Um, but you don't really know uh, in practice. So, so for this, for this work, work, again, you need data citation. So far, I've shown you examples where they didn't include data citation. But this is changing. And there are articles uh, and letters in several journals saying we have to do this. Um, this is our first example of um, when we did get 
um, a, a data citation uh, from uh, the uh, Saragum genomic data. And I want to highlight, because I'm encouraging people to use databases in general, there's a big concern about publishers having their own database because they feel it will fragment the data, avail the, the data that's available. And I would agree with this if the database was the only place that this data is stored. So when we um, put any data in our, in, our data in our journal database, we always make sure that if there's a community database, it is put there as well. We also help curate it so it's put in uh, more easily. And what we are providing on our data site is a direct link to the paper that used it. So if you are interested in specifically finding that data, you can go to our database. But these data are far more broadly available. So this was the, the um, journal that published uh, this, this article. And they cited it in the references. And so this was the first time that anybody had cited um, biological data in a reference section in a, in a citable, trackable format. In practice, also, Nature Biotechnology has done this, and, um, and the many more journals have done this. Now, I want to highlight this particular data set. Um, this was released in 2011, and this is one of the things that we're really encouraging, which is releasing the data prior to the publication. Because, as you're probably aware, it can take up to two years or more for people to publish papers on data sets. It used to be when you sequenced, for example, you generated that and you immediately started writing up the paper. But with sequencing at this point, people are generating hundreds of sequences. So the chances of them getting to every single um, set of data immediately is very low. So putting it out immediately for the community to use is, is really great. Now, what was exciting is this particular data set was cited by in numerous papers in the reference section. So the use of data citation is catching on. Having this data available early meant that all of these groups could publish in areas that they were specifically interested in. They still weren't doing whole data set analyses. Now, I just want to point out again that Cell Press said they would consider it, might consider it prior publication. Well, when they finally got around to publishing the polar bear paper, the analysis paper, it actually came out in Cell. So this is something that I encourage all of you to not just put yourself on this list, but to tell your authors we actively promote early release and citing data. Because researchers are, in fact, afraid to do this. In fact, when these papers started coming out, the head of the organization who had released the data ahead of time was very upset that people were using this data and felt that they had been scooped, when in fact that did not have the impact they expected. Now, there's one step forward and always two steps back. There's a lot of journals that, even though the authors are putting references, uh, data citations into the references, they're actually then removing them. So we've had some interesting stories. One journal informed the authors that non-reviewed material could not be cited in the references of the paper. And yet this paper was based on those data. So were they saying that that paper couldn't be considered accurate? Also, that journal publishes or cites commentaries and editorials, neither of which are usually peer-reviewed. So it was a little confusing. It was a, a very upsetting to the authors, um, but that was interesting. Another journal stripped the data citation from the references and then went the extra step and changed the citation in the data availability section from the DOI to the URL. 
When we migrated our database to a new platform, that link was broken. Now, we happen to know this had happened because the authors were upset and were sad. Um, and so we debated about <laughs> doing it because we wanted to kind of be like, shame on you, now your link is broken. But we, I don't know, cooler heads prevailed. And so we created a forward via the DOI so that now that link will continue to follow wherever we go. But that's one we knew about. Um, I want to highlight that this wasn't a necessarily an editorial policy, especially since one of those I knew the editors were for data citation. The problem was the production team hadn't been informed. And so they were doing what they had always been told to do and stripped the DOI and put a URL in. So if, and I mean when, you decide to include data citations, tell your entire team you're doing this. Okay, the next thing you need for data citations is to be tracked by in, uh, citation indices. And this is, this is being done. I'm highlighting uh, specifically the web of science because we are one of the databases that are tracked in it. Um, but you can, if you have a repository, if you know of a repository, you can, there's a place to uh, link and indicate that you would like to be tracked at, at, the, at the web of science. And by doing this, this allows researchers to be able to show funding agencies not only that they are complying, if the data, if the funding agency has data release policies, but also can show that their money was used to promote additional work. And then finally, there's the usage of metrics by the community because without people at the, within the community focusing on whether or not this is used themselves, they're never going to be really interested in working hard to get their data into databases, et cetera. And this is a work in progress. But I do want to highlight that data citation is a major incentive. It's not on Wednesday this week. It was when I gave this first slide. Just notice that there's always an error. Um, we released uh, the genome sequence of three thousand rice grains. That was 13.4 terabytes of data. Consider that most data sets that are shared are less than 10 gigabytes. Now, and we also deposited these uh, data into the SRA, the single read repository. Um, and the question is, why did we do this too? One, as I said, it's linked to the data paper, and that provides all of the details on how the data was produced, the quality, the basic analyses, which are often, as I said, sequestered to supplements in other journals when they talk about data availability, when they talk about how the data was made. And you can't search those, and most people don't download those. So that is all available. The big, big reason why we did this and why we got the authors to do it was that we could, the authors were willing to now release this data after a two-year discussion because they found a way to have their data cited. I just want to remind you that millions of children per year die of malnutrition, and this is 3,000 rice strains. And it was funded by the Gates Foundation, which has a data release policy. But it was a lot of work, and one of the ways, in addition to supporting them in this way, we have a bio curator who uh, helps um, organize the data for the researchers. So one of the things people say is that my data is too big, and the answer is no, it's not. But you are going to need help. So I just want to run very briefly through beyond data citation, because in addition to data citation, there are things related to this, which is reviewing the data, creating data release policies where you can help the authors, and making data available without the metadata, without the description of how it was, was created, is practically useless. People say that reviewing the data is too much to ask of their researchers, and they can't do that. Well, yes, you can, and we do. And 
we often use data reviewers who are postdocs and graduate students who are the ones who are carrying out that. And all they're doing is looking through it and saying, yes, they did do this, uh, this, these, the important steps that were required. And in fact, we even did this in a neuroscience paper. And what I want to highlight, somewhere, oh, is that the uh, reviewer said at the bottom, in addition to making presented research trustworthy, the reproducible research paradigm definitely makes the reviewer's job more fun. So there are insane people out there. I'm going to skip through this. But I do want to highlight this for journals as well, um, because this is where I really think journals can help. Because we're the communicators of research, we're the communicators of science, we should be helping communicate all items within research. And data availability without metadata is practically useless. Having journals help authors organize their data will go farther toward getting data released in a usable fashion than anything else that can be done. Uh, by a journal. And right now, data curation is currently done ad hoc, and a lot of this is not uh, being used. And you can work with people in your community to help you curate data. We hire a bio-curation curator. So what I'd like you to do is think about what you do and what you can do. You should be promoting rather than inhibiting pre-publication data sharing. And when I say promoting, I mean actively saying, we want you to do this. We were releasing some early data for uh, a, a series of publications that were coming up, and one of the, the, the editors informed the author that they had found, had seen that the data were being re released before the publication, and said to them, you should be aware that people can scoop you. These data were done by a huge consortium and were in, in process. Why they would even tell the person that when it's really impossible, but why they would not, why they would be effectively saying, don't talk about this to a researcher when they're already freaked out about it is, is uncertain to me. You also want to promote data citation in the reference section. It incentivizes data release, and it makes it easier, more importantly, for readers to find. And you want to promote data release, if not early, then upon publication. So you should consider what your data release policies are, if you have them, and how you can follow up with them. And again, I want to highlight that you should form collaborations with repositories to aid authors in uh, depositing their work. You can identify your communities and look for their metadata standards. And then finally, find a way to make these data available for reviewers while you're doing the peer review. This will be a major way to reduce the fact that a lot of papers are being retracted. At least have someone do a sanity check. It's not easy. But think about what you're doing and what you can do. Work toward the rest. Effectively, we just need to evolve. We need to really move past the dead trees of just having an article and not promoting the movement forward of all components of a, of a research scholarly activity. And I would like to thank you. Uh, all of my team at Giga Science, uh, Biomed Central, and BGI. Um, as you can see, this is our this year's uh, shirt um, as part of our promotion of free data. Um, I uh, thank you all for listening, and or for those of you who napped after lunch, I was doing that too. Um, thank you. <laughs>
I, Jan Lesset Pelin from Bureau of Science. As a scientist, I think it's a great idea and I think data should be shared as, as soon as possible. However, data without methods is suspect at best and dangerous at worst. So, I would say that publication of data should include always the publication of methods also used to derive the data and preferably pre-publication peer review of those methods so that we are saved from claims that vaccination causes autism or something like that. Well, we weren't actually safe from that anyway. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you and obviously I have a whole other set of slides about the methods because that's the other problem uh, with data sharing. The data papers that are published provide detailed information on how data were collected. And that's one of the goals of a data paper, specifically. For our papers that aren't just data papers, we expect detailed information on how the data is collected. We do not have page limits. Um, right. You know, actually, I mean, one of the one of the big in initiatives I have for next year is creating, um, sort of putting methods directly into the database as sort of a recipe file that can be updated. So when people find out, oh, you know, when I did this experiment, it didn't work, and you can talk about it with the, hopefully the, the, the data or, or the people who did the experiment, and then you find out, oh, we shook the sample and you rocked it. We didn't think that was that important, but apparently it is. Let's change the methods so that's clear. So making methods not only available but updatable, in my opinion, is essential for moving forward. Uh, Richard Seba, Colchman Harbour Lab. Laurie, um, do you think we need a best practices for citing data and the paper? Because Sometimes authors will not work, know whether they should cite the paper, cite the data, or cite both. And presumably, different authors will make, different readers will make different decisions about that. And, and authors, a lot of them will want the paper to be cited, not just the data. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think, I mean, when I look at, 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 re, at research in general, um, I like to think about what are you, why are you citing something? So, like, the... Lamley buffer is a great example. Um, that paper wasn't a methods paper. It didn't just say, this is how you make Lamley buffer. That was an analysis of, of uh, proteins uh, in, in uh, gel electrophoresis. But everybody cites it for Lamley buffer. Nobody's citing it for the concept. Um, I think if you were citing, if there was a Lamley buffer methods paper or methodology, that would be the thing you would cite. Because then people would know, wouldn't have to dig through to find the Lamley buffer. Now, obviously, everybody knows that's what they're citing when they do it. You've, the people have come to think of that as the Lamley buffer paper, not having anything to do with protein gel electrophoresis. Um, so if you're thinking about large data sets, if you are using concepts from the paper, you should be citing the paper. If you're using the data for something completely different, because a lot of these big data sets can, you should be citing the data itself. Best practices, though, in a discussion of how this should be done definitely is needed um, because it is confusing. Um, and I have my own opinion on how, how, when, and how you should cite each one, but it is my opinion, and I think a community discussion about that and then coming to some sort of consensus would be a really good idea. Hi, Lori. Uh, Adam Etkin from Peer Review Evaluation. I'm just curious, very early on in your presentation, you had the, I know you said the number was exaggerated, but you projected the number of retractions by 2045. I'm just curious, I, I know you had a disclaimer, but how, how that number was arrived at? <laughs> it was based on if the trajectory of how many citations were done and the number of publications occurred. It was basically, you know, 
a fraudulent, this would be retracted and never accepted by any journal, number that effectively if you were to follow that curve, it would ultimately reach a point, a balance point between publications and that. So um, that's why I highlighted <laughs> that it was completely hyperbolic, but just as, a, as I wanted to highlight that this is becoming a big, big issue. And hyperbole is always fun. Hi, Carve from River Valley. Uh, one question and a comment. Firstly, would you agree that uh, an important part of the policy is to to ask for data to be in a an open format? So, for example, on Microsoft Excel, you must have a comma delimited uh, uh, <coughs> file, for example. Secondly, it seems to me, as far as scooping goes. Um, isn't the best way to stop people scooping is actually to release it rather than, isn't it the opposite of that or am I missing something? No, I, I actually agree with you, but people feel that if they've released data that someone will use their data to make conclusions that they haven't had time to make. Actually, if people cite previously published data, it becomes easier for editors to say, look, this, where did you get this data? In which case they have to cite it. Once they cite it, the, author, the reviewer can say, I, I easily was able to go to this site and, you know, the, the main publication of this paper has not been published. We are currently working with our authors to figure out sort of a point at which, okay, you've had time to write the uh, paper and now it's fair, fair game. So it's sort of a, you know, fair, fair use policy. Also, it, yes, uh, our, that's why our data is under a CC0 license in terms of fair sharing, but human data and s similar types of data are very different and everything cannot be completely open. What we're doing uh, currently is we are providing a landing page on, um, on our database uh, that describes the data that is in a protected database and uh, we have a current upcoming publication where that landing page uh, cites exactly where it is in the EGA, which is a hu uh, human protected database at uh, EBI. And we also provide the contact information for the author who handles permissions for that data and all of the documentations, all the forms you need to fill out so that authors no longer are having to search through these databases and figure out the different policies. Uh, so we're trying to do something to not only, you know, still we have to protect that data, and, uh, but to also make it more readily usable because currently protected data is really not used. Sorry, one more question. Um, Jack Bowles from Springer Verlag. Could you explain the role of uh, the bio curator? Uh, our bio curator? Um, when we have a paper submitted, uh, two things happen. The paper starts to go through the standard editorial process, but we um, part of the submission is a table that indicates the type of data, a whole bunch of information about what data you have, and we have a downloadable form that allows you to indicate some of the basic metadata, you know, what tissues or samples, where they came from, what type of data, effective size, etc. At that point, our bio curators from GigaDB contact the authors help them upload into our database so that we can make it available to the reviewers. Um, we also, because our, day, our, our peer review is open and named, our peer reviewers are perfectly comfortable going to the site if the transfer takes a long time. Um, so our bio curators help upload it and then they go through, they give the basic sanity check to make sure it's following the known community standards for specific data types. And we have editorial board members in a variety of different communities that we're publishing data to help us with what are the current standards to make sure that uh, these are, are put in place. Um, so we not only rely on our lead bio curator, but we also take advantage of uh, all the information that's available out in the community. 